these sampling distributions. The Seattle Epidemiology Research and Information Center, in collaboration with the Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA Employee Education System, and the University of Washington Department of Epidemiology, present the 2002 VA Epidemiology Summer Session. We spent the last hour talking about exploratory data analysis and um, I promised you that we would set the stage then for statistical inference using probability and probability distributions. So probability really is the tool that underlies statistical inference and what I would like to go through to um, this hour then is the distinction between populations and samples how we aim to then make an inference about a population based on a sample. We'll actually use a classical example of coin tossing um, to define both probability and a probability distribution. And then we'll um, end by looking at calculating probabilities using a normal or Gaussian distribution. So I will only restate what you already know, that there is a difference between a population and a sample. A population is really the collection of the entire body of observations. So a population is, if we could observe it, the entire body of observations. Um, the term of a parameter is a term that we reserve for a descriptive measure, a summary measure like the ones we defined earlier that are computed from the data of the entire population. So if we had an entire population of students, we might calculate the population parameter of mean age. As opposed to if we look at just a sample um, of a population, which is a part or a subset, as in our small sample of 10 students from a population, then what we would calculate as a descriptive measure is referred to as a statistic. So a statistic is an estimate um, of a population parameter. A statistic is what we calculate based on the sample. So we can calculate a sample age. It's a statistic. And our hope is that it, it may be a good estimate of the true but unknown population parameter. So statistical inference, if we defined it um, in one sentence, we would define it as the um, attempt to make a conclusion, to make an inference about a population based on a sample. So the inference is the surmising or the conjecturing or the conclusion that we make based on data from a sample. And we're going to use the data that we've observed, the information that we've observed, to try to um, conjecture what is true or likely to be true about the population. That's our aim, but in order to accomplish it, we need to use the tools of probability. So again, just to reiterate that we're aiming to make a statement or an inference about something that we actually know nothing about. It's unknown from the point of view that we cannot collect all the observations, not we can't measure all of the observations, but we are able to collect a subgroup or a sub um, sample, a sample of the um, observations, and it's the observed data that allow us then to um, make the inference. So there are many, many questions, and you can come up with more than the ones I've listed here in which um, statistical inference um, is used. The whole debate about whether tobacco caused lung cancer. The um, hypothesis was that tobacco caused lung cancer, and many studies were done, and the, the um, tools of statistical inference were used to answer this question. Um, commonly, the question of whether there's a greater response rate associated with drug A than with other drugs B or C, um, again, it's making an inference based on a study that's performed using drugs A, B, and C, but it's to generalize or expand to the larger population of individuals who may be treated by A, B, or C. Uh, we looked at the example of whether vitamin A reduced child um, hood mortality, other questions, what proportion of women develop lung cancer, and all of you can come up with other questions um, that are of interest to you. So let me um, try to put this in the context then of what is a classical example of, of um, tossing coins. Now I know that in reality, most of us do not toss coins or flip coins. Um, we don't do this in relationship to our research, but, but, <laughs> Or at least I don't think most of you do. Um, 
But I think this illustrates the point quite nicely, and we'll, um, we'll adapt this for other, other more relevant examples. But let's suppose that we don't know the truth, but that the truth has three possibilities. So I'll set this up as three hypotheses. One is that a coin has two tails. The second is that the coin actually has one head and one tail. And the third possibility is that the coin has two heads. So these are the three possibilities that could exist in reality, but we don't know the truth. Um, but what this means is that underlying all of this, I could say that my probability or my chance of flipping a coin, tossing a coin, and getting ahead if the first hypothesis held, the null hypothesis HO held, the probability of getting ahead when you have a coin that has two tails, that chance is equal to zero. Everybody agree? Whereas the probability of getting ahead in under the second scenario where the coin has one head and one tail, that probability is equal to one half. We have a 50% chance of getting ahead if indeed the coin has one head and one tail. If it's a fair coin, if it's a fair coin. So if it's weighted in some way, that, that probability wouldn't be the same. Um, the probability though of getting ahead when the coin has two heads, under that scenario, that probability is equal to one. The chance of obtaining a head if we've actually flipped a coin with two heads is one. So let's think about not knowing the truth and we actually flip a coin and we observe a head. So our outcome is a head. What kind of an inference we, can we make? If the truth is that actually there were two tails, then our inference would be it's not possible. It's not possible to observe a head when the truth is there are two tails. Whereas if um, the truth is that the coin has one head and one tail. The inference is that if we observe a head, that's very possible. The probability of observing a head was one half or 50%. Whereas if the truth is that the coin actually has two heads and we observe a head, the probability of observing a head was 100%, so this inference would have more weight. We would have more weight for this hypothesis, the second hypothesis, than we would for either the H1 or H0. So part of statistical inference then is taking the data, using the data to see what evidence we have for favoring one hypothesis over another one. And in the simple example, we see that the hypothesis would, that would be favored is that we flipped a, a, a coin that has two heads. Can we rule out the, the middle hypothesis? No, because it's still possible that we had a coin with a head and a tail, and we observed a head. But could we rule out the first hypothesis? Yes. So based on observing a head, it's not possible that, um, that the truth is that the coin has two tails. So we looked at this, this chance of occurrence in this simple coin tossing example. Um, and what we were actually doing was calculating probabilities without um, formally defining them. But we can think of probability as providing a measure of certainty or uncertainty associated with events or outcomes. So probability is just a, a, the chance or the likelihood of something occurring. And we're trying to get a handle on that in order to rule out or favor one hypothesis over another. Um, there are some relationships and, and rules of probability. A probability is always non-negative. So if you're calculating a probability and you get a negative value, there must be something wrong. It's always bounded between 0 and 1. And there are some criteria for um, outcomes that um, can be uh, denoted by probabilities that, um, that I'll define using the example on the next slide. So these two criteria that we're interested in looking at are mutually exclusive events and probabilities associated with mutually exclusive events, as well as statistically independent events. So I'll take you to the next slide to make some sense of this. So this is a pretty simple example of 100 individuals that are um, cross-classified in this 2 by 2 table then by gender, either male or female, and disease status, disease or non-diseased. So if I was interested in um, defining mutually exclusive events, I would define it as events that cannot occur at the same time. So are there examples of mutually exclusive events in this two by two table? There are. Right, so one example is um, 
male versus female. So you can't be both male and female at the same time, or at least not usually. So the pro what we see here are mutually exclusive events. The probability of being male is 40 out of 100. The probability of being female is 60 out of 100. So we saw that one probability was 0.4, the other probability was 0.6. So when we have mutually exclusive events, they sum, their probabilities sum to 1. We also see disease status, disease and not diseased, mutually exclusive events. The probability of being diseased in this population is 80 over 100. The probability of not being diseased is 20 over 100. Again, the sum of those probabilities has to equal 1. What about um, gender and disease status? Are they mutually exclusive? No. No, you can have a disease and have a gender at the same time. So what we see are the four inner cells of this two-by-two two table reflect four mutually exclusive categories defined by gender and disease. But we can see that you can be male and diseased at the same time, male and not diseased at the same time. So these are not mutually exclusive categories. So I've defined mutually exclusive events because it influences the way we calculate the probabilities and handle the probabilities. I could also look at um, calculating some conditional probabilities. In other words, suppose I was just interested in the probability of disease in the group of males. How would this change the calculation of the probability? Any ideas? Well, I'll say that again. If I was looking at the probability of disease in males, I would focus all of my attention on the subgroup of males. So what I would see is that I'm looking just at the subgroup of 40 males. The probability of disease in that subgroup is 30 out of 40, or 0.75. If I looked at the probability of disease in females, I would look at just the subgroup of 60 females. The probability of disease is 50 divided by 60. Now, 3, 3 fourths is 0.75. 5 sixths is about 0.83. So what if I ask the question, is disease status independent, in other words, not influenced by gender in this, in this population? False. You would say false because, in fact, the probability of being diseased if you're looking at the group of females is higher than the probability of being diseased if you're looking just at the group of males. So the notion of statistical independence is that the probability of being diseased does not depend on the other characteristic of, of um, gender, male or female. So um, those two concepts of mutually exclusive events and statistically independent events we'll come back to later, but I wanted to illustrate them with this table. OK, well, suppose we actually changed this example. I'm keeping the numbers the same here. But suppose we actually looked at a different example that many of you are familiar with, um, a screening test for a disease. So all the changes here is um, the test result, positive or negative, the disease status, disease versus not diseased. And we introduced um, some conditional probabilities in the earlier example. Suppose that I changed these numbers slightly here, and we looked at some conditional probabilities that may be familiar to you. The characteristics of the test referred to as the sensitivity of the test and the specificity of the test. So suppose we have a, a screening test for a certain disease, and we were interested in calculating the probability of obtaining a positive result in the group of individuals that are diseased. So we'd look at the subgroup of individuals who are diseased, the 100 diseased individuals. The, the sensitivity, by definition, is the chance of a positive test, 85, divided by the 100 total of diseased individuals. Whereas the specificity of the test is the probability of a negative result in the group of non-diseased individuals. Specificity, then, focuses just on the 200 non-diseased individuals, and we look at those who have a negative test result, 180 divided by 200, or 0.9. So this example shows a sensitivity of 0.85, a specificity of 0.90. These are just examples of probabilities, the likelihood or non-likelihood of getting these results in diseased or non-diseased individuals. 
Okay, so let's go back to that coin tossing example. If we actually um, think of flipping two coins, two coins, and suppose that we have the scenario in which we have um, a fair coin in which um, there's a 50% chance of getting a head and a 50% chance of getting a tail. And um, so the probability of head is the same as the probability of tail equals one half. And suppose that we um, actually have the same coin and we just flip it two times. And we'll consider them to be ind independent flips or tosses of the coin. So the way the outcome when I flip that first coin shouldn't influence the outcome of flipping that second coin. Now, the probability then of each outcome we'll see is equal to one fourth. Now, let's talk about what the outcomes are. One outcome is that we actually get the first coin as a tail and the second one as a tail. Or we could have the first one's a head and the second one is a tail. Or we could have the first one as a tail and the second one is a head. Or we could actually have the first one a head and the second one also follows as a head. So here what we have are actually four mutually exclusive outcomes. We can't observe two tails at the same time as we observe two heads. We observe only one of these four mutually exclusive outcomes. And since it was a fair coin, and we, we see that the um, probability of a head and a tail is both one half, each of these four outcomes is equally likely. So each has a probability of one fourth. If we sum them together, the total probability would have to equal one. So I could place this um, as, a relative as a frequency, first as a frequency table. So here were the four outcomes. The chance of each outcome is one out of four. And if we put another column on this slide and labeled it as a relative frequency, what we really see is that the relative frequency is the same as the probability of observing these outcomes. So one-fourth is the probability associated with each of them. The sum of those probabilities is equal to one. Now, I'd like to take you then from this concept of probability, which we said, what's probability? It's just the chance or the likelihood of something occurring, and lead it into the definition of a probability distribution. So a probability distribution gives you a description of all of the possible outcomes and the probabilities associated with all of those possible outcomes. So if I was interested in the probability distribution of the number of heads that one could observe when just tossing a coin twice, a fair coin twice, we saw that we might have had zero heads. We could have had one head, either the outcome in which we first had a tail followed by a head or a head followed by a tail. So there are two different ways in which we could observe just one head. And lastly, there are, there are the other possible outcome is two heads. And we saw that the frequency of that was one out of four. So again, these are the only possible outcomes we could have, right? Either zero, one, or two heads when we toss a coin twice. No other possible outcomes. But what we see is that this count we can reflect as a relative frequency or a probability. And what we see in the last column is what would be known then as the probability distribution associated with all of the observed values of the number of heads that we might see. So what are the observed values? This symbol I'm using is little x. Little x might be zero heads or one head or two heads. So the probability that x equals one, in other words, the probability that the number of heads equals one is a quarter. The probability that the number of heads equals two is also one quarter, whereas the probability of one head, since it can occur in two different ways, is two quarters. So what's the point of this? The point is that we have all possible outcomes, 0, 1, and 2. Each of them has a probability that's non-negative, that ranges between 0 and 1. And the sum of all of those probabilities is equal to 1, equal to 1. And here's just a graphical way of looking at that same thing. We saw the probability of zero heads was 0.25. The probability of, of one head was 0.5. The probability of two heads was 0.25. So I could ask some questions. I could say, based on this, what's the chance of getting one or more heads? And what would you say?
Right, so the probability of getting one or more heads is the probability of one, which is 0.5, plus the probability of two, which is 0.25. So 0.75, or 3 fourths, is the probability of getting one or more heads. What's the probability of getting no heads? It's 0.25. If we knew the probability of getting one or more was 0.75, we also could say that this probability of zero heads is one minus 0.75 because these are three mutually exclusive events. So on this next slide, I've written down how we would write this in a probability statement. We went through this verbally, but the probability of obtaining at least one head when flipping two coins is the sum of those three separate probabilities. The probability of getting a ta tail followed by a head, plus a head followed by a tail, plus the probability of two heads, which we said was 3 quarters whereas the probability of no heads was one quarter. So this is just a simple example of a probability distribution where we had just three possible outcomes and we could clearly talk about the probabilities associated with each outcome. We could talk about the probability of observing um, one outcome or something more extreme. We could talk about the probability of observing no heads. And so it's a probability distribution like this that can be um, established for any type of variable that we're interested in dealing with. And um, last time we talked about the difference between discrete and continuous data. Discrete have gaps in the values like counts. Continuous variables like age or birth weight or blood pressure have no gaps. And statistical inference uses probability distributions, our knowledge of theoretical probability distributions to help describe the possible outcomes that might be obtained and then to associate some probability or chance with the outcome that we observe in the data that we collect. So there are um, listed here the, the four most commonly used probability distributions. And in fact, we're going to only focus on one. Um, in, for discrete distributions, the binomial and the Poisson probability distributions are often used. For continuous, by far, the normal or Gaussian distribution is often used. And another one that's commonly used is the exponential. I'm only going to describe the situations in which you might use a binomial distribution. Um, if you have two possible outcomes for each of n observations, so for instance, in the coin tosses, we had a head or a tail, one of two possible outcomes for each toss of the coin. But one can translate it to looking at disease um, or vital status for, for um, human subjects. We might have uh, um, the outcome of dead or alive, a binary or um, dichotomous outcome. And what we're interested then in is describing the number of individuals that are termed success or failure for each of n possible observations. So the binomial distribution is one that allows us to quantify this. It has far-reaching applications in epidemiology and in some more complicated multivariable methods. But uh, this is a distribution then that we won't be focusing on. We won't be focusing on either on the, with the Poisson distribution, which looks at counts um, of rare events or rates. But these are two distributions that could be employed if needed. And here are some questions that go along with the binomial or the Poisson distribution. So suppose that, that um, you, you actually had either a positive or a negative result on a mammogram for a woman. And one considers that from year to year, over the course of three years, three tests were considered to be independent um, of the previous test. The binomial distribution is the type of distribution that could be um, used in answering the question of what's the probability of two negative mammograms um, over the course of three tests over three years in a woman who has breast cancer. So one might look at the, the um, test result is positive or negative. We know that there's a, a sensitivity and specificity associated with each of these tests. And the binomial would allow us to answer this question. The um, Poisson distribution is a similar one. We have a dichotomous event 
um, for instance, of memory loss, yes or no, and it could be used to answer the question, is the rate of memory loss higher among Gulf War veterans than the general U.S. public? So these type, types of questions can be used, um, can be, can be um, addressed using a discrete probability distribution like the binomial or the Poisson. But our focus is going to be on the normal probability distribution. So many of you have already seen the normal distribution, the bell-shaped curve that's also referred to as a Gaussian distribution because Frederick Gauss was the mathematician who initially um, um, coined this um, distribution. But what are characteristics of the distribution besides the fact that it's bell-shaped? The fact that it's bell-shaped means that it's symmetrical. So we can say that it's symmetrical about its mean, and I might use the symbol mu to refer to the mean or central tendency of that distribution. In, in theory, a normal distribution takes on values between negative infinity and positive infinity. Now, what we know is that although in theory values can range from negative infinity to positive infinity, in reality, most of the time when we're making measurements of blood pressure or weight or birth weight or height, we actually have a bound on the lower limit and the upper limit. But in theory, we could say that the values can go from negative infinity to positive infinity. So the, the distribution is symmetrical about its mean. There's a measure of spread or standard deviation that we'll refer to as sigma. And a special characteristic of the normal distribution is that the value of the mean is the same as the median is the same as the mode. So in other words, the average value is the same as the value of the 50th percentile is the same as the most frequent value. And the area or the total probability under the normal curve is equal to 1. So what are the um, types of questions that we might ask um, with, a, with a normal curve? So again, it's a situation where we have a continuous variable, um, a continuous variable like birth weight. So we might ask, what's the probability of very low birth weight, defined as less than 1750 grams, um, for infants in a certain population? So if birth weight indeed followed this bell-shaped curve, we would be able to answer this um, question. We might be interested in asking whether mean serum cholesterol levels differed between men that were in a diet program or men that were in a diet and exercise program. So these types of questions um, we'll be answering using a continuous normal distribution. Okay, so let's just look at this in a, a graphical way. Here's the bell-shaped curve. We can see the, the mean is mu, we'll refer to it as mu, and the mean and the median and the mode are all the same value. We see that the, um, the random variable x can take on values from negative infinity to positive infinity. And there's a measure of spread that's not labeled on this that we'll refer to as standard deviation. So let's look at the next slide to talk about standard deviation. So if we actually have a, a normal distribution in which the mean is mu and the standard deviation is sigma, then the characteristics of this normal distribution are that if we looked at the mean and we looked at values that were one standard deviation above the mean, so if I took mu and added sigma to it, I would see this cut point. And if we also looked at one standard deviation below the mean, so if I take the mean and subtract sigma, I would come down to this area. And if I could highlight this area that's in between plus or minus one standard deviation, I would see that about 68% of the observations fall in that range. One standard deviation below the mean up to one standard deviation above the mean. So that also means that if the total area under the curve is 1, that the total probability here is 0.68. So 68% of the observations fall within plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. What does that tell us about the other 32%? They're outside of that range. So they fall either above one standard deviation above the mean or below one standard deviation below um, the mean. So 0.68 is the probability in the, in the middle. We'd have um, 0.32 split into two tails. 16% in one tail and 16% in the other. 
Now, a, a second characteristic of a normal distribution is that if we added two standard deviations, so when I'm taking the cursor here and pointing to the length um, on this, this um, x-axis, this is the, the, um, the spread or the standard deviation sigma. So if I added that amount twice, so if I looked at two standard deviations above the mean and two standard deviations below the mean, almost 95% of the observations fall in that range, leaving only 5% split into the two tails, about 2.5% in one tail and 2.5% in the other. Is this making sense? And another trait of the normal distribution is that if we actually looked at the mean and added three standard deviations to the mean or subtracted three standard deviations from the mean, we would see that almost all of the observations fall within that range. So a very, very low percentage fall, more than three standard deviations above or below the mean. So in fact, although that random variable in theory ranges from negative infinity to positive infinity, we would see that most of the observations can be classified as being within plus or minus three standard deviations of the mean. Okay, so think of all of the possible variables out there that are continuous in nature and that may be normally or approximately normally distributed. So infant birth weight, if we took a log transform of serum cholesterol, um, some distributions of other variables. So we can think of many different variables that actually have different means, different central tendencies. And if we saw a de depiction like this, this would say that the spread is about the same in the, these three different distributions. But what's different? The mean or central tendency. Whereas if you saw a depiction as seen in this bottom panel, what we see here is that the, one of these curves is much flatter and has, has um, thicker tails than the um, middle one, and certainly the other one has a higher, a higher mode and has thinner tails. So what we see here is that there's different spread or variability in these three distributions, but they happen to be ones that are all centered at the same mean. So same central tendency, but different spread, whereas the previous panel showed different central tendency, but the same spread. Okay, well, as you can imagine, there are so many different random variables. Each random variable has a different mean and a different standard deviation. We said they all had the same characteristic. I'll back you up just a second. All of these have the same characteristic. The total area under the curve, or the total probability, is equal to 1. We know that, that, the, that within plus or minus 1 standard deviation is about the middle 68%. 95% fall within plus or minus 2, and that holds no matter which of these um, various normal distributions we're looking at. But um, especially before computers, it became very difficult to deal with different means and different standard deviations. So what has been done is that the standard normal distribution is a transformation that allows you to take any, uh, any distribution centered at any mean and any standard deviation and transform it to what we refer to as a Z or a standard normal distribution. So let's think about what this does. A Z actually takes whatever random variable we're interested in, it shifts it in location by subtracting the mean, and then divides it or rescales it by dividing by the standard deviation. So that what we have um, as properties of the Z is that the Z has a mean in which the mean is equal to zero and the standard deviation has a standard deviation equal to one. And the beauty of this, especially before computing was so prevalent, is that all of these have been um, tabled, there are computer programs available to look up probabilities under the standard normal um, curve or standard normal distribution. Whereas we can imagine if we look back at all these possible distributions with different means and standard deviations, it would be difficult to calculate um, those, especially by hand. So let's just think about what that transformation did. The transformation said, let's um, subtract the mean of a distribution. So if we th think of taking all of the possible values of x and subtracting its mean, what would the new center be? Zero, because some then would be less than the mean, some would be 
greater than the mean, the new mean would be zero. The, the, and once we rescale it by dividing by, by um, the standard deviation, the new spread in this z distribution will be one. So here is the standard normal distribution. It's centered at zero. It has a standard deviation of one. So if we go back to the characteristics of the normal curve, um, this would tell us that about 68% of the observations, or the total probability, would fall within plus or minus one standard deviation. In other words, between negative one and positive one. About 95% would fall within two standard deviations of the mean. In other words, between negative two and positive two. And almost all of the observations would fall between negative three and positive three. Okay. So you'll see in the back of the textbook, in the back of any statistical textbook, there is a standard normal um, distribution table in which if we looked up the value of z equals 1.96, which is a number that's very close to 2, we would see that the probability of z being bigger than 1.96 is 0.025. So often for short, we say approximately 95% of the observations fall within plus or minus 2, but in fact, exactly 95% of the observations fall within plus or minus 1.96 standard deviations of the mean. So that if I drew a line at negative 1.96 and positive 1.96, that would contain 0.95 of the um, area under the curve. And if we thought of a two-tailed probability, so when I refer to two tails, I'm interested in what's the probability of a z that's bigger than 1.96 plus the probability of it being less than negative 1.96. So if that makes um, sense, we would just double 0.025 and get a probability of 0.05. There's another common z value that we'll be referring to later, and that's the value of 1.645, because this is associated with just a 5% chance, 0.05, in one tail of the distribution. So what's our so let me just make sure if we go back to this picture that everybody is with me. So if I drew 1.96 out here on the distribution, that would this value of 1.96 would have 0.025 probability associated with it, meaning the value of z of 1.96 or something bigger would have a probability of 0.025. What would be the probability of 1.96 or something smaller? 1 minus 0.025, which is 0.975. And if I looked at the other value of 1.645, I would see that that had a probability associated with it of 0.05. Any value less than 1.645 would have a probability of 1 minus 0.05 or 0.95. OK, well, we will be spending more time on this, but you can also get some um, practice with the homework. But how can we interpret then? How can we interpret these probabilities? If we actually saw a z value that was bigger than 1.96 or less than negative 1.96, those were values that were out there in the tails of the distribution, what would that tell us? Well, as it says in the slide, it's unlikely to occur just by chance alone. Let's make sure that we feel comfortable with that. The, most, the highest probability is actually associated with z values that are near zero, or ones that might fall between negative one and positive one. Values that are out here at negative 1.96 or positive 1.96. Values that are greater than those or less than negative 1.96 are possible, but they're not highly probable. There's more probability associated with these values of z near zero than values of z out in the tail of the distribution. So we would say that values that fall out there in the tails are unlikely to occur. They occur just less than 5% of the time, just by chance alone. We would also see that z values that fall within that range of plus or minus 1.96 are ones that are likely to occur just by chance alone. So what I'm hoping to develop with you here is the notion of these are likely values in the center part of the distribution. Values that are out in the tail of the distribution are unlikely. 
and um, we'll be using this as um, in terms of weighing our evidence. It is actually true that infant birth weights are approximately normally distributed? The only thing that might be a little bit false is that there is a little distribution of low birth weight babies that actually can be considered to be a, a, another little normal distribution. For our purposes, we're going to ignore that and just assume the entire distribution is normal. So suppose we had a population in which the mean birth weight was 3,000 grams and the standard deviation was 1,000 grams. So um, if we set this up, the mean is at the center here at 3,000. And then we would know that about 68% of the baby's birth weights would fall within plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean, in other words, between 2,000 and 4,000. And about 95% would fall within two standard deviations of the mean. In other words, two standard deviations below is 1,000, and two standard deviations above is 5,000. And almost all the baby's birth weights would fall within zero up to 6,000 grams. So we see here um, a normal bell-shaped curve. I've superimposed the normal curve over a histogram because you can think of collecting birth weights and um, forming a histogram that are, these happen to be in 500 gram units. Think of making the, the grouping even smaller. So instead of 500 grams, 250 or 100 or 5 grams, what you would get are very small intervals that are then approximated by this normal curve. And the total area under the curve then is 1, and it represents the probability of, a, of infants with different birth weights. So what's the probability of having a, a baby um, with a birth weight more than 3,000 grams? It's 50 percent, 0.5. The probability of a baby weighing less than 3,000 grams? because of symmetry is also 50, um, is 0 0.5. And, we, and remember, we already said about 68% would fall between 2,000 to 4,000. So the way we would answer these questions, though, is by transforming to a Z. If we subtract 3,000 and rescale by dividing by the standard deviation of 1,000, we would now have a Z distribution instead of an X, in which the mean is 0 and the standard deviation is 1. So if I ask that same question of what's the probability of an infant weighing more than 5,000 grams, you would reason through this with me. And you would say, well, 5,000 is two standard deviations above the mean. And 95% fall within two standard deviations of the mean. So only 2.5% fall above 5,000. Is that true? Would you reason through that with me in that way? So if 2.5% fall above 5,000, we could say the probability is 0 0.025. Or we could have transformed to a Z. If we transformed to a Z, we would have taken, we would have taken 5,000, subtract the mean of 3,000, and you get 2,000. If you divide by the standard deviation of 1,000, what do you get? A Z value of 2. So the probability of X being bigger than 5,000 grams is the same as the probability of, of Z being bigger than 2. Both probabilities are equal to 0.025. So I'll just take you back to this. The probability here in this tail of the distribution greater than 5,000 grams is the same as the probability that we would see in this transformed Z distribution where the Z is bigger than 2. So I could ask some other questions and reason through it in the same way. What's the probability of an infant weighing less than 1,000 grams? Same thing. It's two standard deviations below the mean, so it's 0.025. And then I could answer, um, also ask the question, what's the probability of an infant weighing less than 1,000 or more than 5,000? It would just be the one tail, which had a probability of 0.025 plus the probability in the other tail, which was also 0.025. So we would say the probability or chance of an infant weighing less than 1,000 or more than 5,000 is about 0.05. But again, if we transformed to a Z and looked it up in the table, we would have had a Z bigger than 2 plus the probability of a Z less than negative 2. So this is where um, I'm going to stop because We've now take, we've 
gone through the steps that have allowed us to define probability. We've been able to go from a normal distribution centered at a mean mu and a standard deviation sigma transformed to a z. And if you um, do a little bit of reading and get some experience in using the z table, we will be using the z um, in subsequent lectures. So just in summary, we've talked about the fact that we're, we've used probability to build up um, our tools for statistical inferences about a population based on a sample. Probability provides us with this measure of certainty or uncertainty that's going to allow us to either support or refute hypotheses. And um, although we laid the, the um, framework for probability and probability concepts, we've also laid the, um, set the stage for probability distribution such as the normal one that will allow us to um, describe phenomena of interest to us in answering scientific questions. So any questions? Could you review again how you calculate the standard deviation? Sure. What it is in English is um, the square root of the sort of average um, squared deviation of each observation from its mean. So um, let me take you to that simple example that we looked at with student ages. Um, here we calculated the mean age as being 38.3. Now recall that all of those student ages range from 27 to 52. So the definition of variance is that um, we would take the difference between each age, 27 minus 38.3, square it, add to it the squared difference between 28 minus 38.3, um, again take the difference between 31 and 38.3, square it. So we would have 10 squared terms. We would divide it by the total sample size of 10 but subtract 1 because we have a little uncertainty since this is just a sample. So think of 10 squared terms that we divide by 9. We would get 74.7, .7, but this, this is in terms of units of, of squared years. So the standard deviation is more interpretable because it's the square root. The square root of 74.7 .7 is 8.6 years. So if this followed a normal distribution, we would be able to use this information to say a standard deviation of 8.6, if the mean was 38.3, would tell us that about 68% of the ages are within about nine years of the mean. So within a, from the range of about 29 up to 47 years. Um, a standard deviation of nine years would also say that about 95% of the ages are between two times nine, which is 18 years of the mean. So between about um, 20 up to what's 30, um, 38 plus 18. 56. So in fact, even though this is a very small data set, we see that about uh, almost all of them are within you know, 20 up to 57. So, um, so it might not be inappropriate, though the sample size is very small, to describe this by a normal population. So this was a long explanation to how you would calculate standard deviation. Most of the time, you will not have to do this by hand. It's mainly interpreting it. But if you had to do it by hand, you would take the difference between each of these and 38.3, square them, sum them up, and divide by 9. Good day. My name is Gail Reiber. I'm the director of the VA Summer Epidemiology courses taking place here in Seattle, Washington. I'm happy to welcome you today to uh, hear a little bit about epidemiology in general. My guest is Dr. Ed Boyko. He's a professor of medicine at the University of Washington, and he is also the director of the Seattle ERIC, or Epidemiology Research and Information Center. Dr. Boyko, first of all, tell us what is epidemiology? Um, epidemiology um, aims to uh, uh, achieve several objectives. One is that uh, it is the uh, study of uh, disease occurrence. Um, for example, uh, one objective of an epi epidemiologic study would be uh, the incidence of disease, which would be the rate of uh, new cases of disease occurring. Another uh, objective would be uh, a study of disease prevalence, which would be uh, the uh, frequency of a disease in a, uh, a given community or population. 
Uh, in addition, uh, a major objective uh, of epidemiologic research is to identify risk factors for disease. And uh, the uh, uh, hope uh, in many cases is that uh, information about risk factors will lead to uh, means to uh, prevent diseases from occurring. So what is the status of epidemiologic research in the VA? Uh, well, uh, ep ep epi research or epidemiologic research in the VA has undergone uh, a lot of growth over the, uh, the past uh, 10 years. Uh, I'd like to, to mention a few th things about uh, VA research uh, in general. Uh, first, uh, there is uh, an in-house or intramural research program uh, in the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, and uh, this uh, program has a budget uh, of over $350 million. Uh, in 1997, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs decided to fund uh, three research centers in epidemiology. And these are uh, referred to as the Epidemiologic Research and Information Centers, or ERICs. And they're located in Boston, uh, Durham, and in uh, Seattle, Washington. Uh, in addition, uh, the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs has an epidemiology merit re review program uh, to fund projects uh, in epidemiology conceived by uh, VA investigators. So why is the VA a good place to do epidemiology research? Uh, well, um, for a number of reasons. Uh, one is, uh, and I'll go to the first uh, slide, um, the VA uh, has a national uh, distribution uh, with its uh, medical care facilities. Uh, there are 22 uh, networks or uh, regions. Uh, there are 163 hospitals total, 134 nursing homes, uh, 40 domiciliaries, and 766 outpatient clinics. And uh, there are a large number of uh, veterans who receive care uh, at these medical centers and outpatient clinics and other care settings, uh, over 3 million uh, in 1999. Uh, projections uh, for the number of veterans who receive care in the future uh, uh, lead to uh, uh, one estimate of uh, over 5 million in the year 2004. And in fact, uh, that number might perhaps be higher uh, with uh, current uh, issues regarding pharmacy reimbursement in this country, which are driving many uh, individuals to seek care uh, at the VA. Um, I'll just uh, show uh, some information about the number of uh, veterans who received care at the VA in 1989 versus 1999, shown in the uh, blue columns. Uh, and this refers to thousands of uh, veterans. And uh, in 1989, there were about uh, 2.5 million who received care, as opposed to 3.3 uh, million in 1999, with uh, many millions of uh, outpatient visits. Um, uh, and, and a huge increase between 1989 and 1999. Um, and uh, these veterans, uh, uh, as I'll mention in a minute, uh, are, are elderly and have many chronic uh, diseases uh, that are of great interest to uh, epidemiology researchers. So tell us a little bit more about the systems that are in place to deal with this spe special population. Uh, well, um, there are uh, uh, many different systems that uh, uh, facilitate epidemiologic research. Uh, there are uh, national databases uh, that contain information from all VA hospitals and outpatient clinics. Uh, and so it allows uh, investigators to go to one site and, and obtain information uh, about the entire uh, VA uh, uh, system and, and, and the population that it serves. And this is uh, very important to uh, ep epidemiologic investigators because uh, uh, a lot of our research in this area is on small effects that require uh, large populations in order to study, uh, uh, to study uh, the hypothesis with a lot of uh, precision. Um, there is also a computerized medical record that is uniform throughout the VA system uh, called a CPRS. Uh, and uh, this medical record has allowed uh, several data warehouses to be uh, developed regionally, uh, which would facilitate research in this area, and possibly uh, at some point in the future there might even be a, a national uh, data warehouse. Uh, there's a, a central organization uh, in the VA with uh, a, a headquarters in Washington, D.C., that I think uh, facilitates uh, system-wide cooperation and uh, interaction. Um, there are some problems with the VA uh, system as a resource for uh, epidemiology investigators. One is that it's, it's unclear 
uh, what the denominator is and who all might be eligible to receive care at the VA. Mm -hmm. um, epidemiologists can work in any one of a number of places. Why would they want to work for the VA? Uh, well, f for several reasons. Uh, uh, the first is that many VAs have affiliated uh, universities, and so uh, uh, investigators uh, and physicians and clinicians who choose to work at the VA can also have a university appointment as well and feel part of a university research community. Uh, the VA also has uh, a uh, career development program uh, for uh, clinicians and for PhDs uh, and other, uh, uh, and, and other uh, investigators uh, to help start them out uh, in, in a career in research. Uh, the VA also offers long-term employment uh, to investigators uh, like us um, and, uh, and, and helps to retain us uh, in the system. Uh, and um, there's also a successful uh, history of cooperation uh, across medical centers, which uh, also helps to uh, uh, make uh, research more attractive and enterprise in the VA system. The results of some of the epidemiology research that you do, does it just benefit veterans or is there a broader implication? Uh, well, uh, uh, there uh, probably is a broader implication uh, because uh, the research on the veteran population uh, probably uh, can be uh, extrapolated uh, to uh, veterans uh, not uh, captured uh, b by the VA medical care system uh, or even non-veterans who uh, have the same uh, demographic characteristics. It takes uh, um, a leap of faith, but it's probably a small leap of faith to, uh, to accept that. Does the VA work with other organizations and other researchers in the EPI work that they do? Uh, yes, uh, the, the uh, VA investigators uh, work with uh, investigators funded by uh, other, other federal agencies, uh, foundations, and uh, private industry. And in fact, uh, many VA investigators uh, receive funds uh, from the VA uh, and also from non-VA sources such as uh, National Institutes of Health, other federal uh, entities, um, private industry, and also uh, foundations. In terms of the Seattle Epidemiology Research Center, what are some of the future directions that you wish to take your staff? Uh, well, I think uh, that uh, one of our uh, big uh, areas of interest is to uh, try to use uh, the systems in place uh, uh, in, in the VA system nationwide uh, to facilitate uh, epi research uh, to answer several uh, uh, key uh, questions that we are posing. Um, in the past, we've uh, done a, a systematic analysis of the uh, magnitude of uh, the problem of diabetes within the, uh, the VA system. Uh, and uh, in, the, um, in the future, we're aiming uh, to look at other chronic uh, conditions that are very prevalent in the VA system, such as a coronary artery disease, to see how we might use the existing uh, databases to arrive at uh, answers that might ultimately uh, uh, be used uh, to, to uh, benefit the health of veterans. Dr. Boyko, thank you very much for joining us today and answering these questions. Thank you very much.